It's been quite a year, and I'm kind of changing my usual, here's all the data about low carb and keto. You've probably seen that too many times now. So I'm going to give an update on what this year has, or two years has been like. Um, I see a trend, and you probably do too, that this, what we know as evidence-based low carb, high fat, low carb keto, and now internet-based keto is causing a lot of confusion, and I've learned a lot about that this year. Um, my disclosures, I'm an associate professor of medicine at Duke, and I'm a past chairman of the board of the Obesity Medicine Association, the largest group of doctors who treat obesity with medical tools, not, not the surgeons. I'm co-founder of a company that's an education and product company based on low-carb concepts, Adapt Your Life. And then I'm a book author and get royalties on three books. And you know, if you write books these days, you realize it's not a way to get out of your practice. It doesn't make money like it may have used to in the past. But my latest book, End Your Carb Confusion, has been very helpful. And, and you're going to be, you know, spoiler alert, it's not just a keto book. So check out End Your Carb Confusion, written with Amy Berger, who many of you probably know, and that's why it's so readable and so accessible, is that Amy put her heart into writing that book, too. So, you know, um, we went around the country with ADAPT events, our keto events on Saturdays, and, and I was able to teach low-carb diets in nine different countries in 2019 what a privilege it was to do that. And then when the COVID hit in February, we were just leaving Long Beach at, at an event on Saturday. And I'm in the taxi or Uber going back, and he said, you know, should I make people start wearing masks? And I said, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. Uh, but yeah, I probably would make people get in and wear masks. And then I get back to my, uh, my practice at Durham, in Durham and get back to my home, and there's this box from a friend of mine in Shenzhen, who I've been with several times now teaching. There's actually a hospital that uses low-carb diets in China. And there was a box that arrived and it said, you may need these. And it was a bunch of KN95s. And it hit, as we watched New York kind of just go up in flames, uh, my daughters are there. Durham had no masks, had nothing. So there was an army of volunteers who started making masks. There was a, there was a group of people who were out uh, of work from the local Carolina Ballet, which now was totally stopped. They had no, no money, no income. So I worked with the lead uh, at the Carolina Ballet. We started getting doctors to start funneling money to make masks for people who couldn't get masks, which was just about everyone. And one thing led to another. I, I started seeing all these different masks, and I wondered which ones work, which ones don't work. There, there was a sock manufacturer down the street who was selling socks for masks. And you could just go like this, and you see right through them. And you know, it was like, really? So I call up you know, the Duke University physics department, and you know, everyone's off. Everyone's on shutdown, and the do uh, PhD answers the phone because <laughs> there was no administrator at work. And I said, you know, I saw this New England Journal mask uh, laser study. The, it was like so obvious, so simple. I mean, you, why do you put your hand in front of your face when you have a cough? right, to maybe stop the cough from coming out. So I, I saw this new letter in the New England Journal where you just put a cloth in front of your face and the, the particles coming out are blocked by a laser. So the physicist says, well, yeah, we have a laser expert. His name is Martin Fisher. And yeah, I'll get him on the phone. Everything's locked down. And so he cobbled together this laser kind of MacGyver thing where you, you would be in front of a box and you could speak into the box and you could see the spittle come out in the box with laser coming this way. I was sitting in the basement of the physics department at Duke when everything was locked down, being a participant in this study that basically said putting something over your face stops stuff from coming out. Is it really that simple? 
I think this is kind of my recurring theme, that things can be simple. <laughs> things don't have to be complicated. So we took the, the 10 types of masks that we were vetting for use now in the underserved populations, the nursing homes, the, the, the people who had nothing to cover their faces with, and we put them in front of our speaking voice, in front of this box with a laser beam going across, and sure enough, putting something in front of your face stops spittle from coming out of your mouth and getting into this box. This was done in March-ish, and by the fall, what, can you remember this controversy? Is it, masks don't work, you no, know, you know, you can, you can go back a hundred years and cloth masks were being used. So Mar Martin, you know, we can't get anyone really to help out with the study, everything's locked down, so he gets his daughter, Emma, to come in and help work on the, you know, we didn't have to worry about spreading the disease. Low-cost measurement of face mask efficacy for filtering expelled droplets during speech. Basically, you put an N95 over your, your face, it blocks part, well, I guess the main thing is that when you speak, stuff comes out of your mouth. And so for those of you who have been around today, it's not that I'm worried about you or me, or me I'm worried about you. I might be talking and giving you something. And what's amazing is, um, Bill Nye, the science guy, did a TikTok on this, basically showing how well masks work. But what we did is we wrapped a little science around Bill Nye, the science guy's TikTok. And um, what was fascinating is that, yeah, you, you go like this, you blow through things, they get a little worse, and then if you use a, a sock in front of your face, it does nothing, you know. Um, so. By the fall, by the time this got published, it went around the world five times. In fact, I may be known now as the Gator study, Duke mask study doctor over a keto doctor. Because this study, if you've ever seen this science metrics, is the 37th most cited article ever, in, ever since this has been collected as a metric. And did you see something just came out of my mouth? Um, so, uh, if you wonder if I think masks work, yeah, I stood in front of a box in the bottom of a physics department and saw stuff come kind of out of my mouth in front of a laser beam. We went to the local Museum of Life and Science and they came up with a little, well, we can do it with a, a flashlight and, and a mister and it's to show how lasers work and so. Um, if you don't want to spread or inhale things that are in the air, put a mask on, okay? So meanwhile, back to low-carb diets. Um, so simple things work, huh? So low-carbs and obesity, low-carb diets started in the 1860s. William Banting, not related to the Banting who worked on insulin, different Banting, um, started talking about low-carb diets for obesity. And then years pass, it becomes vilified and, and forgotten, and, and uh, the study that kind of nailed the final nail on the coffin was in 1980 by someone who became very prominent in the cardiology world, John LaRosa, and it was 24 people who were obese and, and lost weight on a low-carb diet, but their um, LDL went up. Significant increases occurred in LDL. And so for the next 22 years, you couldn't find a study on low-carb diets until Jeff Volek at UConn, now at Ohio State, and Westman and Yancey at Duke approached a doctor who had used it for 30 years and said, you know, why don't you do some research? And he said, okay. You know, and the story I heard later is they were really kind of shocked. An academic, let alone two academics, came and wanted to do research. They weren't researchers and everyone thought they were crazy. And now uh, Dr. Agatston and I are looking at each other saying, Dr. Atkins was, was right. And, um, but that's after 20, well, for me it took 10 years to kind of figure it out. I'm a slow learner. 
and now it's 20 years later. But so what I've been able to do is really put the science around something that had been around for you know, 100 years before, something that now makes sense in terms of carbohydrates and insulin and kind of worked out all the mechanisms. But the randomized trials that were done in the early 2000s were all comparing low carb and low fat. And now, you know, there's so many studies that there are studies of studies being done, and this just pulls out the main data tables from all of these randomized controlled trials. My colleague, Will Yancey at Duke, decided, well, gosh, if this is so strong, why don't we study a low-fat diet with Orlistat compared to a low-carb diet? And they did within a VA, Veterans Affairs population, and the low-carb diet worked as well as a diet and a drug. So if you wanted to use a drug in a diet or just a diet, hmm, which would you prefer for, for using something? Uh, and um, I, I love this slide because the, all of the individuals are shown on here. In one line represents one person. And you can see there's variability in the outcome. And you can see both work. And so my position has always been that you know, there are a lot of things that work but low carb and keto should be at the table in terms of obesity. There are as many studies done as would be required for FDA approval of a drug. So I started saying, you know, if it were a drug, it would be FDA approved, but there's no process for approving a diet. It's only drugs. Um, so here, Sam Feltham in the UK put together an infographic that shows the score. The score is 31 to nothing. Low carb beats low fat in randomized trials. And yet, you know, I'm still saying that low fat can work because we want to tell people well, why could it work in some people and, and not in others, the low fat thing, and why low carb works for everyone. And, and it has to do with insulin resistance. Uh, but um, that's where the prescription strength idea came from, and then it got popularized on that peer-reviewed journal you see at the grocery store checkout called Woman's World. Um, <laughs> and I, I, my picture is photoshopped on there, but um, the prescription strength keto kind of came out this year, um, and which is one of the th things I've been, you know, teaching this a long time. Things started changing, and oh, right, and we got low-carb diets into the, the algorithm, and um, guideline of the Obesity Medicine Association. I'm past president of that organization, and the algorithm is downloadable for free from the Obesity Medicine um, Association website. Turning to diabetes, it's kind of a similar story. A hundred years ago, low-carb diets is all doctors had to treat diabetes, and it worked pretty well. This book was given to me as I was doing my first study at Duke, and it was uh, there at the Durham VA. The hospital director was lobbied by one of the dietitians to actually shut down the study because I was studying the uh, uh, Atkin, uh, Atkins diet, and, and it was a high, f f high fat diet. I'm trying to remember the stuttering I used back then because everyone knew I w was looking at me and I was saying high f f fat. And, I hope you don't remember those days. <laughs> anyway, we basically were studying in 1998 what was commonly used, you know, 70 years earlier. And I have this still in my office as a, as a show and tell for people um, that it's a 10 gram per day carbohydrate diet and there's actually 10 grams of alcohol on there too. So I, I use this kind of a, as a, if people zone in on the alcohol, oh, and you can have alcohol, okay, I got this. We, we'll, we'll tell you yes in small amounts, moderation, yes, you can have some alcohol. But so for diabetes, you know, I, I even, I put this in because I stumped professors of endocrinology with this question. How much glucose is in the blood? Well, gosh, you know, Eric, why is that important? Well, diabetes is defined as a problem of too much glucose in the blood, is it not? Well, yes, but, you know, there's insulin. No, no. If it's too much glucose in the blood, how much is there? Well, I, uh, okay. So what I do is I say, spoon feed, pun intended. There are 10 milligrams. No, first thing you go by uh, 100, right? You check the blood sugar is 100. What does that mean? Well, it's 100. 
milligrams per deciliter, and then you go through the calculation, there are 10 deciliters per liter. So I write this out, and you know, I'm so gracious, unless the person's kind of, you know, irritated at me, and then I really make them go through every little calculation. I had to relearn this when my kids were in middle school. You know, I had forgotten it, and then they, they, they got calculus in high school, and anyway. So it turns out, oh, sorry, going back, there's, uh, you cross out the, um, the, you remember the zeros on the top and the zeros on the bottom and the milligrams cancel out and the, the, you're left with five grams of glucose in the bloodstream. Why is that relevant? All oh, right, diabetes is too much glucose in the bloodstream. And, you know, a hundred years ago, when doctors didn't have medications, they used a low-carb diet to reduce the amount of glucose going into the bloodstream. Hmm. Well, I finally have now editorial uh, control, which is tr the true final place where you have total control, really, because you can just say yay or nay. And I wrote an editorial published just now that has this calculation in it. So it's in the peer-reviewed journals now to show how much <laughs> glucose is in the blood. In fact, during the, the peer review process, it was, I was accused of just putting something that was obvious, and, and this is in all the textbooks. So, you know, I went to the library, and I pulled the three most popular endocrinology textbooks and excerpted everything about diabetes in there, and there wasn't this. So the editor who was in charge of the editing of my editorial was convinced, okay, I mean, he showed data that it's really not in the, in the textbooks yet. I want, we want to get it in the textbooks. And it's relevant because diabetes is a problem of too much glucose in the blood. So anyway, um, can it really be that simple? Can it, can it really be that simple? Just keep the glucose low, keep the carbs low, you know. Well, you know, you can't, um, if you're in the power position, while there was no randomized trial that says high carb and insulin is better than low carb, which was in the textbook, the Osler textbook of medicine, there was no randomized trial that said that was better. So the standard of practice today really has never been proven to be better than a low carb diet. And yet, if you're in the power position, you can say you need to prove that a low-carb diet is better than the standard of care, which is 45 grams of glucose, 15, or carbs, 15, gram, 15 carbs uh, per serving. So three servings. So it's only three servings of carbohydrate per meal, and then you give insulin. That's how you treat diabetes. Or maybe you could give 10 grams of car. Well, so thankfully, and and this just kind of. You don't trust studies that are funded by companies, do you? Oh, no. Well, you can trust this one. It was done by Verda, Verda Health. And, and, and you can trust it because Steve Finney and Jeff Volick are principals. But some, it's all these weird things. That you can't trust a company study. Well, I want you to trust this one. In fact, no one else would do it. You know? And then you can't trust studies funded by GoFundMe like Dave Feldman's CT angiography. I mean, so you're going to hear all these different criticisms. Just look at the data. And, you know, they put diabetes in remission. And then if you have diabetes in remission for five years, it's called a cure. This is even in a paper by, um, by a Dr. Buse, who's over at UNC down the street from me. The problem in their paper is they say, you, yes, this is how you define a cure, but we really never see it. We really never see people cure diabetes when you tell people to eat 45 grams of carbs every meal, use insulin. Why would you ever see a cure, you know? So I'm sure if you haven't, um, if there's one study to read about diabetes and nutritional ketosis, low-carb diets, this is the one. Published in many different forms now, uh, Hallberg uh, um, and, and all the others, t t over uh, 262 people, you know, and, and now I'm, I'm in the, my evidence-based medicine mode of, no, it wasn't a randomized trial. But you don't need a randomized trial to prove that something that's never happened happens. So anyway, but it can't go into my little evidence-based table of randomized trials, unfortunately. It's still in the, you know, um, 
non-randomized group, but no one else has been able to achieve this level of diabetes remission, and it's a pioneering study, thanks to Verda Health, Steve Finney, and Jeff Volek. Um, yeah. You know, but even before uh, that what study was published, uh, my colleague Will Yancey at Duke, who's been involved with me for uh, ever since the beginning uh, of studying low-carb diets, positioned himself to be on the American Diabetes Association panel of nutrition. And he tells the story that you need to hear someday of how he got the low-carb diet into the guideline, which was in, in part of the, a paper basically saying low-carb diets are okay to use you know, with medical monitoring for diabetes. And this has been very influential because the dietitian world is very um, much um, driven by guidelines that come out from the American Diabetes, Diabetes Association. But now there has been this paper as a, a kind of cover for you to use low-carb diets for diabetes, um, which, you know, is really just recreating what was used 100 years before. Kind of got through all of this 50 years of noise and distraction, and now we're back to a way to lower the blood glucose. And, and if, you know, if you have five grams of glucose, um, a medical student recently, you know, he said, why is that relevant? I said, well, how many carbs are in an apple? And he said, well, I don't know. Oh, gosh, now we have to teach everyone about nutrition and apples. And No, you don't. Just you know, tell them a list of foods that don't have carbs. They'll be fine. In fact, uh, Mark Cusiello is here. Thank you for contributing to a little pamphlet of nutrition guide through Guidelines Central that can help you or a practitioner de-prescribe medicine on a low-carb diet. Um, so now we're, we're actually teaching people how to do this um, that was done a hundred years ago by, you know. <laughs> but there's that, not to worry, there's still something to be worried. It can't be that simple, right? I mean, there has to be worry. Oh, but, you know, I sense today that I tell people not to worry, but there are other practitioners who like to tell people to worry. You know, I, I, I'm a, I like to relieve anxiety about things, not create it. So. When, when this uh, figure came out, it was brilliant. I'd like to know how it was created. Banpuri is the first author. Uh, this is the Verda Health data set showing basically all of the parameters that were measured uh, about um, metabolism in the Verda Health study when, while diabetes is getting fixed. And oh yeah, they lost weight too. Um, everything is better except the LDL. LDL. Of course, this is the surface LDL, the Friedewald equation, the, the calculated LDL, and of course, um, so everything goes in the direction you want except that one thing. So, and, and you notice if you're new here, we talk a lot about this and, you know, a lot of doctors only focus on that. The, I pulled out an old paper by Dr. Gerald Reven, who really created this whole mess of insulin resistance, the idea years ago at Stanford, and it was marginalized because LDL dominated. So the, the whole idea of, of triglyceride and HDL and glucose metabolism and insulin is not new, uh, although Jeff Volek has published now many papers uh, since that time, um, we don't focus on the LDL. We focus on the triglyceride and HDL, the abdominal circumference, the blood pressure, um, and blood glucose. That's called the metabolic syndrome. But also you want to focus on uh, whether someone's smoking, uh, other factors, not just that, you know, LDL. Well, Reven had published a paper in the 1980s called uh, something to the effect of seeing the world through LDL co colored glasses. And it was so for, you know, propitious, it was like, uh, you know, he could see the future, basically, that not only then was it becoming so LDL-focused, but even today. So remember, keto addresses insulin resistance and the metabolic syndrome, and not so much to worry about the LDL in total. It's, it's only the way I explain it is that's the old way. Yeah, 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 but that's the old way. So I'll cover up that on the computer screen. The new way, see the triglyceride and HDL over time? Oh yeah, it's getting better. Yeah. So you can, you can look at this um, on your own panels. Uh, you can do the NMR lipoprofiles and 
recent paper said that the insulin resistance score from the NMR low epi profile was better than anything else. That was a paper uh, by Dugani et al. Uh, from this earlier this year. Uh, but um, so there's a new way to look at the uh, metabolic syndrome. Um, and no, there isn't a randomized trial yet that says treating metabolic syndrome with drug or diet reduces outcomes. That's a study that needs to be done. It needs to be done. And, and then maybe the you know, naysayers will say, okay, all those things that got better, yeah, there were outcome changes too. Um, but as what it was, um, we're sitting at a poster, um, I can't remember where we were. I, I was with diet doctor Andreas Ienfeld. We were looking at this poster and, and it was the study that came out of Israel, still one of the best studies, uh, the diet trial there, workplace diet trial. And the investigator said, you know, and at a year, here's the things that happened and you know, but we still don't know what happens after a year, and more research is needed. And so, Andreas, if you uh, know Dr. Ienfeld, Andreas is looking down at me and saying, well, at a year, was it looking good or did it look bad, like it was going to be getting coming down like a ship, you know? And the investigator said, no, everything looked fine at a year. You know, but the naysayer, what, a year and a day, what happens? Well, a year and two days, right? So we need to do that study. I want to do that study. I want to be involved, and, and I think there should be people who are keto zealotoids, zealots, if that's a term. There should be vegan zealotoid. I mean, well, I don't know any academic program that has a vegan diet in it uh, that, you know, it's still kind of marginal. Remember, the, um, the studies that have been done in the solidly nutritionally replete uh, uh, dietitians, even academia, don't quite know about vegan yet because they have no publications. I mean, how do you how do you talk about it? How do you vet it? You know. Um, so we've been doing evidence-based keto for a while, creating a lot of the evidence too. But a lot of other programs have come out. Um, the uh, Verda study had 30 grams total carbs, and you know other people taper down the carbs, individualize it a little bit. But we all use carbohydrate restriction, focusing on keeping the carbs low. We all use evidence-based diets that are nutritionally complete, with evidence on real food or emphasis on real food and protein rather than fat as the primary nutrient. We've never talked about ketones and fat as the primary nutrient. It's always getting some protein in. Um, so the term that Verda came up with was well-formulated adequate protein ketogenic diet, which is a brilliant way to say it. And these programs give ad lib uh, access to low carb foods. You can even put people on a research ward, let them have free access, they eat less, diabetes goes away. That was Bowdoin et al. 2005. I know it's ancient history. Um, you can uh, look at all of the studies and nobody added medium chain triglyceride oil to an obesity trial or diabetes trial that I'm aware of. Uh, nobody asked people to put fats on steaks and, and add keto coffee, whatever, uh, you know. Um, nobody added ketone drinks in the obesity trials, the diabetes trials. And these were been used since 1863 without any of these things. A few studies, but very few studies, have used computer apps, ketone measurements. I mean, the Verda study being an exception. It's very, very high-tech sort of thing, which we do expect out of Silicon Valley. Um, but so that's really kind of my evidence-based teaching. And what we do is we teach people um, an uncomplicated version that's been around 150 years. So you, when you're hungry, you should eat. When you're not hungry, you shouldn't eat. If that means you eat one meal a day, two meals a day, great. If you want to call it intermittent fasting from within, fantastic. No white knuckling through 18 hours of not eating, though, please. So you can have meat, poultry, fish, and shellfish, and eggs. These are great sources of proteins. You don't avoid fat in real foods, but you don't add fat if you're trying to lose fat weight. Uh, you get the fatty acids that you need through these animal sources of meats. You really don't have to worry much about that. So um, oh, at the very top, I, I have uh, tested this on internal medicine residents at Duke, and you know, no one has proven me wrong yet. And that is diet, diet and nutrition is really pretty simple. Protein comes first. 
You can run your body on carbs or fat, and it's your choice. If you want to run your body on carbs, eat carbs. If you want to run your body on fat or burn your body fat, just don't eat the carbs. And, and so if you're trying to lose body fat, the way to start burning body fat is just not by eating the carbs. Your body will naturally start burning fat. So it's really that simple. And I don't worry about the nutritional completeness if it's an animal-based sort of program. Um, I, just, you know, I just pay a little more attention to what people are eating if it's not um, the um, uh, meat-based. So you can do keto vegetarian, you can do keto vegan if you want, um, but I worry a little more about what people are eating. Um, two fistfuls of leafy greens, one fistful of non-starchy vegetables. Uh, this is a um, rather simple system. Two cups really is about two fistfuls, and um, one cup of non-starchy vegetables. But you know, if you, you teach this, you'll realize that not well, very few people have had nutritional training. Very, you know, if you tell someone to eat a vegetable, they, they may, might not even know what that means. So what we learn is to put this all on one sheet of paper and hand that out to people. And um, it, it worked until this one fellow didn't quite understand and he kept coming. And I, and I said, you can't read, can you? He said, no. So you want to make sure they can read. Um, well, then we came up with a picture one, you know, so it's not difficult. But, okay, that, that was supposed to be kind of funny, not, <laughs> not, um, not sad. For, he was actually a good, happy guy. Um, he just couldn't read, you know. Um, I remember, I'm practicing in Durham, North Carolina, okay. Um, so most people find what they like here, and, you know, someone will look at this and say, you know, oh, I don't really like artichokes. Well, then don't have them, for heaven's sake. You know, choose what you like from the list. These are just carefully selected to be low in carbs. So um, four ounces of cheese uh, per day, uh, creams and oils, two tablespoons, mayonnaise, two tablespoons, some olives. And, you know, someone asked me recently, well, where did this come from? Well, I actually visited a doctor who used this for 30 years, and I said, hey, can I study what you do? Yeah, no one ever asked. So it, I borrowed this from Dr. Atkins. And if you visited their clinic, it didn't say four ounces a day. There was a blank. So I learned, uh, sadly, Dr. Atkins dies right about our, our second study was coming out, but I learned from Jackie Everstein, who was his nurse for 30 years, and I visited her office. She sat in there going, well, this week, you can go from three ounces to four ounces of cheese. And I saw people go, oh, oh, that's so great. So, so you can fine tune the, the individualization of it. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, you can go from five olives to six olives this week. Oh, thank you so much. And so, <laughs> so, um, so we kind of, uh, I don't know how to say it, mass produced the, the list and put down some numbers to start with. Um, and then, of course, what, what's really kind of interesting and, and strange but nutritionally okay is that you can have sugar-free jello and pork rinds pretty much as much as you want. Uh, if you don't know what a pork rind is, that's a chicharrones. And I, I, chicharrone, I, I have my best chicharrone ever. It's really, it was pork belly in Colombia. I'm teaching this in Cartagena, and, um, and I, I asked uh, people, and I was told there's a three-second delay because it takes more words in Spanish to say things. So in my English was being translated into Spanish, and, and I said, so how many of you love pork rinds? Thousand one, thousand two. Oh, all the, all the hands go up. So it has no carbs. Uh, so anyway... Um, this is the uncomplicated keto that we've been using. We studied it, we use it, and I've treated thousands of people, including people with medical issues. My background as an internist, and you know, I have to say a general internist at an academic center meant we felt we could take care of everyone. You know, bring them on, and, and that's really been my, my mentality. But it takes, it's complicated to treat someone with heart failure. It's complicated to treat someone who has a ventricular assist device so that they're on Coumadin and you're watching their salt. And I mean, this goes way beyond what dietitians are trained to do. Um, and, but one of the 
nice things, uh, one, one reason why people send the patients to me is I don't add medicine. I don't operate on people. I just change the food. Can it really be that simple, huh? Uh, yeah, I think so. So here I am, happily coming to meetings and all this, and then my patients started saying, I did keto, but it was too expensive. I'm like, well, what do you mean? I mean, I, my patients go to McDonald's off the dollar menu. They taught me that. It doesn't have to be expensive. I got tired of buying those keto drinks. Well, what keto drinks? <laughs> yeah, do I really need to put fat on my steak? We can thank the Swedes for that. I, I mean, and I love that keto blah, 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 coffee. It's like, the what? We never studied any of that. That doesn't come from the medical world. Where does... I didn't have time to fill in my app to find my macros. Where the hell? Oh. <laughs> Keto suddenly became complicated and confusing. It became like this fire hose. So people were now coming to my office saying, you know, I did keto and blah, blah, blah. It's like, well, you didn't do my version. You didn't do my version. So best I can tell, and I've heard a lot of people talk and I'm using a lot of other people's thoughts here where keto became this kind of internet coalescence of three major themes. One is the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. You're going to see dietitians make this faux, you know, false step in, in the media. I mean, it's so embarrassing that they don't know that they always oh, the ketogenic diet for epilepsy at the very strict and every ketone and the macros every meal. That's not what we're talking about. Not for, for this type of weight loss and for diabetes. Paleo and primal, suddenly people said you had to have grass-fed beef and, you know, butter that's from, you know, I don't know. Uh, and where did this come from? So what we knew was based on carbohydrate restriction, using total carbs, not net carbs, but suddenly there's this explosion of information. So last year, one of the pivotal pivots we did uh, as a uh, company, uh, this is, you know, everyone's got their side hustle, right? And even academics have to have that. I mean, there's not much, anyway, <laughs> I won't go into that. So our goal was to improve people's uh, health and information, to, to get the, um, what we were doing in the clinic, to scale it up so other people could use it. And, and I have to thank everyone who tried to help with the clinic-based venture I was on. Many of you contributed to that. I thank you for that. Sadly, that had its demise uh, pre-COVID, actually. The company didn't make it. But uh, so the Adapt Life Academy is a digital class without seeing people. You start teaching people at a distance. And there are two master classes. I mean, that, those details aren't important. The, but what I learned is by teaching the, what I knew, the evidence-based uh, keto, uh, it really worked really worked and motivated people, for heaven's sake. I mean, these are people who sign up and pay some money to do a class, and we help people lose over a ton of weight. Of course, it's self-report, but over the three-week time period we taught them and followed them in a, in a, a social media group, we're, we're helping people lose tons of weight, and I'm not even seeing them in the clinic. It's pretty amazing. So what we did is we surveyed, the, uh, I thought, well, how can I get some information about this? Um, and 75% uh, of the people had been on keto already. 25% were beginners, so most people had some experience. 94% said they learned something new from our class. When I thought what we did was old, right? So anyway, the new keto information, the keto entree into doing this, um, led me to the top 10 misconceptions about how to do an evidence-based keto diet. So, are you ready for the top 10 list? So, number 10. My apologies to, to Dorian and Keto Mojo. Um, uh, measuring ketones was required. No, it's not required. But everyone thought you had to measure ketones. Well, it's on the top 10 list of one thing we told them they didn't have to measure. Macro calculation was required, people thought. No, you don't need to monitor macros if you just follow this list. And actually it confused people because the macro would say, you need to eat more protein, or you haven't had enough calories today. Instead of listening to your body, you're listening to some sort of, some, some sort of um, uh, uh, prediction, prediction of what you should have. There was a false belief that medium chain triglyceride oils were required that this is what keto was, and it got so distorted, one patient came to me thinking that just drinking apple cider vinegar was what keto was. 
And he said, well, it's great because I'm not hungry. And I said, well, are you eating anything? No, I'm just having apple cider vinegar. Like, well, if it's that strong, then we need, to know, we need to study that in the context of a weight loss program because that's not safe. So you, you can get distorted in, in having, it's protein that comes first, not apple cider vinegar, okay? And uh, so people came to me saying, well, I, how long do I have to fast? So I, where did this come from? Well, I need the autophagy and I, so actually fat burning is called fasting. Fasting is fat burning. You're getting the same benefits from Okay, I haven't proven this yet. It's my hunch that you're getting the same benefits from a fat burning when you're not eating and fat burning when you're eating. So we call this fed fasting. That goes way back to Cahill and, and Ollie Owen who came to the first Brooklyn conference that Richard Feynman put on and they, they called a low-carb keto diet fed fasting as a description of the metabolic th process going on. Number six, nuts, nut flours, and nut butters are okay. Uh, if you've never heard of a trigger food, trigger foods are foods that you eat and you can't stop eating them. So we say no nuts, no almond flour, no peanut butter. And there's, while there's maybe an initial, uh, people are happy when they come back. So take away the nuts. Vegetables are unlimited. Well, no, remember there's a limit on the vegetables and leafy greens because they have carbs. So the first thing is to keep the carbs low. Protein comes first, keeps carbs low. So a lot of people said, remember this is a survey we did. These are the top 10 things that were different from what they were doing before. So net carbs uh, is keto, and this is where I bring in the over-the-counter versus prescription strength keto. It's not right or wrong, uh, but it's going to be stronger if you use total carbs. So net carbs is just a way to eat more carbs, so to speak. So if, you're, um, if your metabolism requires that you need to be really, really strict, if you have diabetes, metabolic syndrome, 200 pounds to lose, you want to be sure to use total carbs, not net carbs. Um, and look at the total carb on the label, not net carbs on the front. So artificial, artificial sweeteners were forbidden, many people thought. No, no, most people can use them and, and lose weight just fine, fix diabetes, lose fine. What about all of these other side effects? No, I mean, they're relatively minor or non-existent. Again, I, I don't like to fear monger. I want to take away fear and anxiety about these things. Getting to the top two items that people said they learned from you know, internet keto, misinformation to what we taught, um, expensive clean food was required. And um, this is where that, oh, it's so expensive to go to those stores or get all, the, all the, this stuff. No, you don't have to have these things. Now, it's great if you want to use your food dollar to change the world and change the food environment, how it's delivered, and then great, do this. But in, in Durham, North Carolina, it makes it impossible to use a low-carb diet if you require this. I mean, in 95% of my patients. I need to meet them where they are uh, in a, a clinic like I'm in. So the number one mistake, Number one thing that people were doing, learning this on the, the internet, that they felt really was the change that made it work for them in our program, was too much cheese, fats, oils. So if you remember in the little handout, it said cheese, four ounces a day. Cream, cheese, oils, there was a limit on it. Today, many people get the idea that because it has zero carbs, you can have as much as you want. Well, technically, if that's if you're if you're buying a uh, a book that comes off the shelf, it isn't clinic tested. Remember, I went to a program that had already used this for 30 years. Yeah, I cheated. I I didn't come up with this. I I just studied it, and so they learned early on. Now, as I talked to them, that they had to put a limit on the cheese, fats, oils because there's so many calories in there. This becomes actually a diet that. Uh, won't work for weight loss. And actually one of the other things I did over the past couple of years, 18 months, is I guest edited a couple journals and I pulled in some really interesting work from individuals 
Sam Feltham, at, in the, who had that infographic, did an N of 1 study, you may have seen it on the internet, where he over-consumed. He ate 5,800 calories of three different diets for 21 days each, with three months in between. It was like he did this own, his study, he never put it together formally, so I helped him put together this, and actually he gained weight on a keto diet at 5,800 calories per day. But he didn't gain as much as he gained on a high carb, same calorie level. So the diet had worked differently. Well, it's only one person, but the difference was, was large, you know. And so, um, yes, you can overconsume cheese, fats, and oils. Sorry about that. And that was the number one thing that people learned coming into our class. So just to kind of wrap up, um, Evidence-based keto has been around a long time, well, before studies done, and it's based on, you know, keeping the carbs low, getting protein coming first. Uh, so it's safe and effective when it's done right. Keto works for just about everyone, I have to say. I mean, you put people on a research ward, give them access to the food, it works great, 100%. You get motivated people who come to a digital master class, and I mean, it, that, it's overwhelming. You know, I, I've been in a clinic with one person at a time seeing results. I now am on calls where there are 300 people getting this kind of result at the same time. You know, highly motivated, they're actually doing it, uh, and then just be very careful the, about the products that uh, say great for keto diets. Right now, the, the uh, manufacturers are coming out. I don't know who's advising them, honestly, because you got these weird, maybe low carb, and lots of these other sweeteners that um, one of them actually made my ketones go up and, and my glucose stay the same, but it was at the expense of 300 calories. So until these are studied in the context of a weight loss program or a diabetes program, you really don't know how they're going to play out in terms of the consumption of the food over the, the entire course of the day. So that's where, you know, you want to be careful using those things. I don't say don't use them, just don't expect it to work automatically. Then, of course, if medical conditions are present, you have to have monitoring or unless someone knows what they're doing in terms of the medication, sure. but. Um, that's, that's what keeps me up at night. It's the, did I really make it clear to this person that he needed to check his insulin before taking, needed to check his glucose before taking insulin every time? I was with a student recently in the clinic and, and I asked the patient in front of the student, now what does insulin do? Uh, if the blood sugar is 100, which is 6 millimole, if the blood sugar is 100 and you take insulin, what's going to happen? Well, I looked at the student, and the student looked at me with shock, and afterwards we debriefed and said, you know, doctors might have trained this person or someone trained this person on what insulin does, but clearly the person didn't know. So even if someone's, you know, um, trained and, and doing all these things, we assumed control of all of that using a prescription strength type of diet, you know, and, but then doctors don't understand how powerful diets are, and um, I hide under that some because, you know, doc, I'm just changing the food. You know, how can that be harmful? <laughs> so, you know, well, um, it's actually very powerful, and it's, it's amazing. It's so unbelievable. Nobody believes it, right? And so full circle this year, the last couple of years, it's great to be back. Um, yeah, Zoom sucks. There's, you can't gauge the audience. Uh, and um, it's been so exciting to see all of the new things that are happening, the presentations here and, and going on uh, outside of Low Carb USA. But again, thanks to, uh, to Doug and Pam for having me speak and being here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Dave Feldman. <laughs> Actually, I, I really have to thank you so much for your number one being what's basically my number one. Um, I feel like probably one of the worst things I ever heard outside of low carb coming up to finding low carb was empty calories because empty calories gives you the sense of permissiveness towards food that I never thought would harm me. I'd just be like, oh, well, it's just absent nutrients. I frankly feel like inside of low carb, one of the worst things I heard starting off was to fill your macros. 
And now I'm like, yeah. no. What does that mean? Exactly. As, <laughs> as in add fat. Try to find enough fat in order for you to have hit the percentage levels that were prescribed. And that's what got me into having a lot more liquid, liquid and refined forms of fat to be added to the diet. And ironically, that was one of the first things that I found when getting into lipids is actually one of the best little indicators is fasting triglycerides. Because fasting triglycerides being high was one of the things that I noticed would be a lot more common if I was having a surprisingly large amount of liquid and refined forms of fat and how it would kind of sneak in. So I, I definitely think it's something that unfortunately a lot of people feel exactly the way that you described it, that you can just have unlimited fat. And once you've hit the ratios, you're all set. But I agree, that's a big problem. Well, and then be careful of who's teaching you. There are, there are many ways to do this, and the person who's teaching you, it might have worked for them. So, you know, everyone's different, and if you follow the, you know, young, uh, buff, exercising, person who never had to lose weight to do keto for losing weight, you might not have the best teacher, right? So consider the source of information. Um, I, I trust the doctors uh, who have been in practice teaching keto and, um, and even sometimes computer scientists. By the way, I just have to once again thank you, Eric. Uh, not a lot of people realize this, but you were one of the very few people very early on who thought that maybe I should put a little more effort towards getting into the literature. So I appreciate all of the mentoring and help that you've given to me and my team, and I just wanted to, just wanted to give you one more thanks while we're at it. You're very welcome. And I, I know, um, here, here I was on, you know, just ready to relax on the low-carb cruise. Um, hopefully it's coming back next year. I, I don't, I'm not the ringleader of it, but the low carb cruise. And this young man comes up and says, Doc, Doc, I got, got to show you something. It's like, well, okay, you know, I don't know if I was on my pina colada yet, but um, <laughs> no. Um, and the, it was Dave, and he said, Doc, look what happens when I check my cholesterol five times a day. He's like, what? <laughs> you do? <laughs> and so, you know, maybe it was, me just being supportive or, or uh, you know, I'm used to dealing with crazy people, but um, <laughs> I, I really admire what you've done, Dave, so keep it up. And we don't know the answer to, to a lot of the questions, so we should do research, not tell people not to do it, you know, unless it clearly is like you're on the edge of a cliff, so back at you. Thank you. So, so uh, well, I wanted to thank you also because you lead, this talk actually leads into what I'm going to talk about tomorrow in my breakout, which is we don't know when it comes to about buying what's quote unquote keto or low carb, it's really the wild west out there. There's no real enforceable standards. So um, I want to thank you. The question is, do you, do you go over with people like Besides that list, do you give them or show them how they could be misled or provide, say, avoid these quote unquote packaged or keto type products that have that name? Well, you know, my teaching is pretty simple. And if you have the teachable moment to say, just stay to these foods, you know, someone's listening and they really do it. I don't teach by you can't have, can't have, can't have, can't have, can't have. There was a great um, talk by Georgia Ede at, here at Low Carb USA. She talked about the psychology of subtraction. If all you're doing is taking away things from people, they'll feel like you're taking away things. So I teach by just stay to this list. And then if someone comes back distracted by that, I'll say things like, if it says keto on it, stay away from it. You know, uh, I wish eggs had great for keto diet on them. You know, why, why isn't the egg board coming up, good for keto, good for keto? You know, they probably sell just fine. But uh, no, so I, I don't do a lot of um, discouraging of that, you know, unless someone comes in obviously doing that. Um, but yeah, I, I share that same concern. It would be great if there was some standard for use of keto, but I, you know. We're working I, on it. I remember a conference years ago where low-carb manufacturers were around and there really wasn't any standard for it and it didn't fit into the framework. And yeah, so that, that's great if you could work on that. It yeah. seems like now the, uh, that 
one keto cupcake thing I had, Duncan Hines makes, um, yeah, my ketones went up, you know, because I was drinking coconut oil. And, and you know, because you make it with coconut oil, but it was at the expense of so many calories, and I wanted two, and then three, does it then become a trigger food, like fat bombs are to a lot of people, so you want to just kind of stay away. I think more research is needed in, in that realm, uh, even, uh, you know, before you can say keto, you know, give it to 10 people and see what happens, not just to their glucose and ketones, but are they able to lose weight? Are they able to fix diabetes? Um, well, you know, it all comes down to truth and labeling and, and advertising. So that, that's the challenge for this community, and that's something we really need to get ahead of uh, because it'll be decided for us if we don't decide it. Yeah, I, I, I'll be there. Thank you. I'll be at your breakout. Thank you. Um, you know, but then it's kind of how do you rustle together a bunch of renegades, you know, us renegade people. Yeah. So I, I hope I show you I'm not a renegade. <laughs> I'm not a rogue. Someone said, oh, you're such a rogue researcher. I thought, no, I'm not. Oh, well, yeah. maybe perceived as such, but yeah. Thanks, Tony. Thank, no, thank you for all your great work. You're welcome. Dr. Westman, my name's Steve Panelitis. I'm a surgical oncologist from York, Pennsylvania. And your job is easy because everyone who comes and sees you wants to lose weight. And well, they not necessarily. I mean, yeah, no, some people are from the internal medicine teaching clinic, which is one of the underserved okay. clinics. Uh, well, so no, no, it's actually great. When well, I'm trying to be a provocateur here. <laughs> yeah, okay. So my job's not easy because people show up, they get their cancer treated, and then I tell them, you know, you probably got your cancer because of how you eat. And you're going to live longer if you can change how you eat. And these six medications you're on, they're all related to your insulin. And I see 35 patients a day, but I just make a point of having the conversation with one or two of them. So if you were in my shoes and you had 10 minutes to spend with a patient to set them on their righteous path, besides telling them, buy end your carbohydrate confusion, written by Dr. Eric Westman. That's a good book, I hear. It is a good book. <laughs> I've gifted it to several people. But what would you do if you were in my shoes? Yeah. Um, great question. And uh, I think there's a percentage of folks. So it's going to match the educational level and educational uh, how people learn, right? So some people, you just give them a list of foods and they're off to the races. Um, most people are not going to see the connection between diet and, and cancer immediately, so it's, it'll seem like a bait and switch kind of thing, you know? Um, so you might want to develop a handout specifically for your patients that have uh, either it could be a list of foods or it could be resources. You're going to get a percentage of folks it will do it just like that. Some people even just kind of have a book on the shelf and say, hey, you know, why don't you go look into this? And you're going to get a percentage of folks who'll do that. Um, if you have deep prescribing that needs to be done off those medicines, then you're going to want to develop a system to have them come back to safely get off diabetes and high blood pressure medicines. Um, I think um, people who come to me, I try to find what pushes their, their button, you know, their why. Um, cancer's a pretty powerful one. A lot yes. of people will come to me already thinking they want to keep insulin low and the, know about Tom Seafried and, and, and all that. And uh, I send people to Miriam Kalamian, you, you know, for if someone wants to get a con consult or get a book on it. Um, but I, I can't say, like a prescription drug, this will fix your cancer. I can't. So you might want to target, well, with this approach, I can fix your obesity, diabetes, PCOS, fatty liver, you know, your fatigue, all these other things. But I'll teach people and say, this may help the cancer. So Thank good you. luck. Thank you. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, one last thing, and I had to learn this as I pivoted from inpatient um, clinic classes. I have a YouTube video affectionately called Dr. Westman Keto Duke Diet White Coat Video. 
actually that just weeds down to that one video and it's of me teaching the class that I do and I've been using that this last year and for those people who actually watch the video it works really well <laughs> but in my area I, mean, I can't be guaranteed that someone's gonna be able to find the video it's fascinating I mean so um, it has to match the the educational level and ability uh, and, and desire uh, uh, to learn that's, that's one reason why we have videos, we have handouts, um, we have books. If you're a reader, try this, if you're, you know. Um, but I think many tools are required or, or needed, yeah. Hi, I'm a pharmacist. Sorry, don't throw anything at me. Um, but I work under a scope of practice managing diabetes, and so I try to encourage my patients as often as possible to take this low-carb approach as much as I can without getting fired or in trouble from the other disciplines. Um, but a lot of times, I tell patients, you can get off your medicines for your blood sugar, and it blows their mind when you give them a simple overview. But you mentioned one of the causes of high blood sugar could be the drugs themselves, you know, mental health meds, pred chronic prednisone for COPD or autoimmune conditions. So what's your success rate with patients that are on those proglycemic drugs that are for other conditions and getting them off their diabetes medicines? Or is it just simply a matter of you're going to we're gonna get you off as much as we can, but you have this underlying drug that we, you know, until you can get off that one, your, your sugars are just naturally gonna be higher, you know, using, using the diet approach, of course. Yeah, the most common drugs that um, slow down the weight loss or glycemic improvement, um, uh, prednisone, of course. I think this is good to overcome uh, even 20 to 30 milligrams of prednisone a day. So actually someone on chronic prednisone, this will work. Um, they might have struggled a little more with hunger and, and you know, not automatically reducing how much they eat. Uh, the other one's uh, nasal steroids, uh, great for reducing allergies, great for making you gain weight and your blood sugar going up, uh, not to name names, it's Flonase is the most popular one. Um, <laughs> and, and so I deal with that every you know, spring and fall when people start going on these medicines. Um, gabapentin is a weight positive drug. Um, and, uh, you know, most yeah. drugs. And I'm in a mental health clinic, so a lot of antipsychotics are what I'm dealing with too that have those metabolic issues. Yeah, this will, this will overcome that. You have, okay, yeah. yeah. So I want to um, give you the name of Sean McKelvey. Mm -hmm. Sean McKelvey actually has created a program based on a study that he did um, where they, teach people how to de-prescribe medications. He's in Vancouver, yeah. and he had the first conference on de-prescribing medications this year. Great, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Sean McKelvey. Hello. At UBC, University of British Columbia. I just need a clarification on one of your slides when you talked about amounts. So it was you know, the leafy greens and the non-starchy vegetables, but then you added like olives and avocados. Does, do, is that all, like you can have all of those things in one day and that still keeps you under your 20 grams or are you having to choose between avocados and having a non-starchy vegetable? Remember, it's not, it's not a competition. <laughs> but you could have a, up to all of that. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, mean, I kind of remember it at first. It was, <gasps> how many did I have? Five or six olives? And, and now I kind of see it's just a, it's a way to make sure that there's just a limit. You know, every li everyone's, lim everyone's limit is different. But if you really want to be in ketosis first time, every time, like a prescription drug, then yes, follow those limits. And you could have those. But actually, in reality, your hunger should be gone. And you should be asking me, you know, do I have to have food? That's when you're really a fat burner. When you're burning fat so well, cravings are gone. But yeah, it could be any of those. And you can actually um, download page four from the ericwestmanmd.com for $9.99. You know, I handed it out for free for years. It was available on the internet for free. No one wanted it. It had no value. So I thought, well, how can I support the clinic? And, and um, I'll charge it for nine, charge $9.99. Suddenly it started selling. <laughs> it's the weirdest thing. You know, you say one thing, people won't, and you charge. The, now I'm thinking I should charge it for $19.99. <laughs> people, people even want it more. 
So thank you. I was I'm like deep in the chronometer macro nightmare and, Cro and I, the chronometer. It's a way to do those macros and it's show like, me the study. I can never get the macros. So this show is me, like heaven open to me. open question. Show me a study with chronometer for weight loss, and I'll comment on it. There are no hasn't been studied. Yeah, I know. It's helped a lot of people, and you know, over-the-counter internet keto can work for so. It's so robust because low carb, because you're actually targeting the metabolic reason you're gaining weight and the reason for diabetes. So, um, if that's not working for you, you might consider something simple and uncomplicated. Thank you. You're welcome. Mark Kukasala, West Virginia University. Um, I just wanted to pass on a kind of a comment and a thank you. Um, one of the things I really enjoy about these conferences is people really share gratitude to those that have helped them. And I think we saw a little bit of that this morning, you know, with Dr. Finney, the recovering academic, and Dr. Agatston and Gary later. But I just wanted to share just a little bit about Eric, but a little behind the scenes over the last month that probably some of you um, aren't aware of. So. Eric is the, was the edited an issue of Frontiers in Nutrition on low carbohydrate approaches and um, we got a, a collaborative group together from around the world to publish, an, with Sean McElvery was in that, to publish an article on de-prescribing. You know, and it's not easy to get these articles into journals, so with Eric being the editor, you know, we felt we had a fair, an honest, fair peer review, <laughs> right? Not biased, honest, fair peer review, so we submitted the article and went back and forth and, you know, got a lot of really good feedback and made a lot of corrections on it and um, it was accepted and um, we needed uh, the open access fee, you know, so working in uh, West Virginia in an institution that really doesn't promote much of this type of work, um, you know, I was like, can you help me? And Eric, out of uh, the generosity of his research um, funds, made that open access so you can and I just opened my phone, so in two weeks, the article, and you can, you can Google it, just type in Frontiers Adapting Medication for Type 2 Diabetes to a Low Carbohydrate Diet, and it'll come up, but it's been downloaded five, over, almost 5,500 times in two weeks. So we're, we're getting this out, you know, kind of in the underworlds with kind of, a, you know, get high with a little help from, from my friends. And, uh, <laughs> But he's also, I think, you know, so, so many people in this room have, have mentored, you know, kind of entry-level, you know, Dave Feldman, you know, entry-level researchers, you know, so, um, you know, plant a seed and give it some space and let the seed grow to fill the space. So I think if, you know, Chris Palmer's he here from Harvard, so I think, you know, all of us as we go forward, we'll try to encourage, you know, young writers and young academics to do little projects and these little projects can grow, but just want to pass on that gratitude. I think we wouldn't be in this room here together if not for Eric's work. You know, D Doug's conferences wouldn't exist. <laughs> you know, we wouldn't have the credibility, but, but that's all. But, uh, you know, thank you, Eric. Well, and thank you. Don Pedro, sod father, ruminati. Um, <laughs> thank you again. Um, and just to piggyback on, on what uh, Dr. Kukuzela just said, um, uh, you've been very gracious to come to my tribes and speak to them, and my tribes are forage agriculture, so uh, you would imagine that they should know this stuff, and you, you come and speak with them, and you know, then the problem is they know me and they know I'm a forage agronomist, so why do they listen to me? But I bring a doctor and they're like, wow, this is amazing. So thank you for I'd that. I've never, never been to a conference where there was grass and cattle, so that was pretty fun. <laughs> I'm certainly willing to help broaden your horizons because um, Lord knows that tribe needs the information. Um, you asked about why you don't see great for keto on various real foods in the market and or why the egg board or the beef council or these others don't do it. Um, it came as a surprise to me that many of those organizations are funded by contributions from their members through established processes that are overseen by the USDA. Yeah. See where I'm going with this? 
so if they're going to produce anything with those funds, it has to be reviewed at cost and approved by, so please, can we get this organic fertilizer sorted out? Because it's amazing how many ways it stands in as, as obstacles to getting the information across. Um, but meanwhile, uh, thank you to you and to others who are willing to come and speak to those audiences and bring this message to them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Westman. Um, I have a question about uh, type 2 diabetes, and I've been reading uh, studies that suggest that even among patients who don't lose weight, that their metabolic markers improve radically. And I'm wondering if you could just comment on that. I found that a fascinating result. I wouldn't have expected it. Really? Yeah. Well, I mean, at the, isn't the kind of the gold standard your type 2 diabetes or you're obese? You need oh, to. Oh, no. Not everyone with type 2 diabetes is obese. Remember, it's, a, it's defined by an elevated blood glucose, elevated blood sugar, not obesity. So most time, I don't know, 80, 90 percent is associated with obesity. But um, no, you can actually, in fact, that, that was Tro, Dr. Tro Kalajian's mission to do a case series showing that he could fix diabetes without weight loss. And that was one of the articles in the, guest, uh, the journal I guest edited. Um, so look up Collagen uh, and its frontiers in nutrition, like the uh, Kukazella study. Uh, but um, no, it makes sense to me because if you have five grams of glucose in the entire bloodstream and you're eating 150, 200 grams of glucose or sugar, carbs, which, you know, <laughs> the, the student came to me and said, well, that's milk. I said, yeah, but that's sugar. He said, no, it's not. I said, well, okay. I said, it's carbohydrates. And then we, I said, Google it. And he looked up, you know, milk, go lactose, it's glucose, lactose, glucose, and galactose, gluc it's sugar. Oh, but maybe half of it. So, so I don't split those hairs. Why not just say you can't have that, you know, uh, so keep the carbs super low. You're reducing the contribution, not only the blood glucose, but I think the downstream effects of insulin is what you want to try to protect against. And then I didn't get into it at all today, but in terms of longevity, the, lots of different science to say organisms of all different types live longer if the insulin is lower. Now, it doesn't say that they were, didn't eat carbs to make the insulin lower. It's, however, the, uh, these are organisms to the level of a of C. elegans worm you lower the insulin, it lives longer. So why wouldn't you have other effects besides just fixing diabetes? And it's not always with obesity. Yeah. Well, I'm grateful for that. Thank you. Yeah. Welcome. Okay, I need some criticism. Please, I'm not... Uh, no criticism. I can't take all of this loving. <laughs> <laughs> I'm nine hours jet lagged, so I'm not a nice guy today. I'm st I apologize for that. But um, no, you, have it. you and I have had a lot of interaction over a long period of time and, and a lot of people forget that Eric is one of the authors of the new Adkins book, 2012 I think it was, um, and have a long history with Adkins. One of the greatest challenges I find in my rookie patients is they are so proud when they come in saying that they're eating three Adkins bars a day <laughs> and they're drinking the Adkins shakes and you know, one of the greatest challenges for us is, and, and why we struggle, is we can't monetize the space. Everybody else monetizes this, but you can't monetize something where you're not selling stuff because people don't need stuff. They need food. Um, here, so, buy my, don't eat this. Exactly right. Buy my little <laughs> empty bag of nothing here because I'm fasting. It's, but the cha really, you can give us some insight into, number one, what happened with Adkins? What, what ha why is that, has that name been so pimped out? And secondly, um, what do you do in your practice? How do you handle that, all those Adkins products? Because they really are the enemy, in, I believe, in part of what we're doing. And then, just because there's nobody behind me, a separate question. Can you hold, the, hold that question in yeah, your head? Yeah, Because I won't be able to hold no, it in No, that's mind. fine, that's fine. So, 
the products is an easy way. You just look at total carbs, not the net carb thing. So just turn the label to total carbs and follow that standard 20 for the day. And that'll get rid of the, any of the Atkins products that uh, the shakes. Some people can drink a shake or I, I even teach have a swig of a shake, Atkins or pure protein or whatever. Is there a South Beach shake, Dr. I? Oh, he left, so anyway. Um, uh, Look at total carbs, not net, and that's going to control all of these other sorts of products. Um, but if you drink one swig of a Atkins shake, I calculate out it's half a gram of carbs. Now, so yeah, early on, if someone's like, "How am I going to get chocolate?" I work through that. Here's some ways to get chocolate, and uh, depending on your metabolism, you don't have to get lilies and I mean whatever brand is marketed as keto. If you like that, you can, and I don't like dark chocolate. So if someone comes in, oh, and I'm doing keto, and I'm doing dark chocolate, and I say, do you like it? They say, well, no. They're like, well, <laughs> how long are you gonna continue to do that, right? So total carbs, uh, and then, you know, the Atkins company, when I knew it years ago, I don't consult with them anymore. Um, it seemed like they shifted to a healthy eating, sort of uh, not a therapeutic, weight loss doctor program anymore. Um, and they made some decisions to up the carbs. And I think it's been helpful for a lot of people, but not for those who need to be super low and to become keto. It does, it destroys it quickly. You know, um, of course, yes, yeah, so if you cut the 20 gram bar into four, that means five for, but who's just gonna eat? Well, but I freeze it and I just have one. Okay, great. I mean, so I'm pretty, um, uh, allowing for lots of variations as long as it's working for someone, but a lot of times it doesn't when you're eating those sorts of things. Great. And uh, the second question is, and I know Gary Tobbs is going to be here in a little bit. Um, I wrote back and forth with him a little bit ago about this, is that if people are not willing to believe all the negative studies out there with regards to low-fat diets, and this several of major studies, millions of dollars worth of studies that have shown that the low-fat diets really are not as effective as we want them to be. And yet, in defense of those low-fat diets, the folks that believe in them distort the reality of those studies to continue to believe them. And we're sitting here saying, we must do these studies, we must do these studies. Why is positive evidence going to be treated any way differently than negative evidence, which they don't want to change their mind. In other words, it's a mindset issue, not an evidence issue. I, if you notice, I don't give a lot of evidence in my work because I can find evidence probably to say that if you stand on your head for four hours a day, you'll lose a ton of weight uh, and your diabetes will go away. So Because you're not eating. Because you're not eating, right, exactly. <laughs> well, I suppose so part of, the, part of the question is what do we do with all this evidence? How do we, yeah. it's nice for us to say rah, 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 we're, we're encouraging ourselves, but how do you do that? That's the first part. And the second part is with our patients, that evidence doesn't resonate in terms of sustainability. What do you do with this new practice that you've launched that's wonderful? How are you going to ensure sustainability so that the process ends about 10 minutes after they die? <laughs> yeah. Did you catch that? The, you have them do it forever. Well, um, there are a lot of ways to support people, and you know, like many of you, you, you may not have had support, so there are going to be a percentage of folks who just do it and maintain it, come to conferences like this. Um, people who end up in my office usually are the, you know, they're the tough folks who need the hand-holding, need maybe recurring appointments. I set up a Facebook group now that has over 20,000 people for free. It's all admin volunteers who are doing it, former patients of mine. Um, the for, uh, for pay Adapt Your Life company by popular demand now has a payment membership that we provide service for. Uh, we had Gary Taub speak to the members. We have all sorts of, you know, like friends of not mine come and speak, and, but it's only, it's exclusive. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, 20 bucks a month for that kind of support, but you don't have all of the noise of that Facebook group that's open to everybody and there are admins that aren't paid, you know, you don't get the kind of service that you get. But I think for, relatively inexpensively, you can support people at least until 
they get it down so well. Um, Dr. Sue Wolver, who came to my office and started a practice in um, Richmond, Virginia at VCU, uh, kind of explains it this way. There, you know, there's some people, it's like teaching them to ride a bike. Once they get it, they, they're on their way and they don't need the teacher anymore. In fact, I'll never forget the look in my child's eyes when they learn to ride a bike and they say, see ya, dad. You know, it's, it's freedom. Uh, but then there are people kind of like playing piano to learn an instrument. You need to do it every day. You need, at first, you need to be, focus every day. And if you don't practice perfectly, it's okay. You, you know you're going to be doing this every day. And so I think it really depends on the individual. Um, I, I've kind of given up on the... Um, the saber rattling at um, the national level or guidelines and kind of in my mind think of Nina Teicholz and the Nutrition Coalition as a group that has some, just like your slide where we're, we're sand all separate, getting into groups that have lobbying power will help I think in the long run. Of course it, it, it takes longer than you ever think but um, uh, so some people need the help, others don't. The carb addicts uh, may need to zoom in. Uh, all, I, I'm not sure if you're still doing that, uh, Dr. Iflan, but may need to have constant contact with other people to get them off the sugar. The sugar, because you know, sugar's everywhere. You know, it's. I thought it was hard to help people quit smoking. That was my prior career, and it, it was. But then we started having drugs and all this. So I, I think of the sugar-free things as getting people off of sugar addiction, at least at first. Um, and I, I'm not, I don't have any problem using those. So all these different tools, all these different uh, places where people are coming from uh, kind of tailors the support, in, in my view. I mean, that really is the greatest challenge, is sustainability. Thank you. Yeah, well, you know, I wish there was a, a patch for sugar addiction, you know, <laughs> that... <laughs> Do you have any questions? There are a few questions here. So, uh, okay, Dr. we've got a few Ed, minutes. <clears throat> we have a few more minutes? Five no, minutes? we actually... Five minutes? Yeah, uh, no, one question, and then we've we got to... One it question. Ada Ramos is asking if you could please touch on those that follow instructions but their blood pressure is resistant to go down. She's had a 32-year-old client. BP could not budge in, in three months. Is that not enough time to see it increase, decrease or? Yes, not enough time. So uh, of all of the medicines or processes that get better in a clinical setting, I've treated people who have diabetes, high blood pressure, all these other problems all at the same time. The diabetes medicines need to be deprescribed quickly, often cutting them in half on the first day or, or even stopping them. And my, I have a new world record now for me. Dr. Unwin did this once, you know, well, how much insulin did you get someone off? It's the world record and I think I am now at the top. I'll have to ask David about that. But um, this person came off 600 units of insulin in three weeks. And she monitored at home and knew how to take it, take it off. So, you know, now that there's a regular strength insulin, now there's a double strength insulin and a triple strength. There's actually a five times strength insulin. So no worries, we don't have enough skin to inject it in, we'll just make it more concentrated. So that's the, uh, the path of eat anything you want and we'll just treat you with drugs. Uh, so blood pressure is, is different. It takes longer. Um, in fact, if it's related to insulin resistance, then it, it, you might not fix the blood pressure until someone's almost at their weight loss goal. But I do recommend home monitoring for blood sugar, blood glucose, and blood pressure um, and help people interpret that um, because the blood pressure may go low between visits if you see someone every month, for example. But I, so don't... Don't give up yet. Great, thank you. All right, thanks. It was awesome, thank you.